every day you're being told to to improve your operations, to meet your deadlines, to be the best possible leader and manager you can be, and you're getting pushed down from your VPs or your CEOs and being told what to do and you feel like you just have to do it or you'll be in trouble. Today, I'm excited to welcome Lou Carter to the show. Now, this is a really interesting podcast today, folks. Um, So Lou Carter isn't your typical lean, you know, practitioner, lean thinker, although many of the things that he's going to talk about are completely aligned with all the things that we're talking about. But but Lou is actually um, the founder and CEO of um, Most Love Workplace, uh, Best Practice Institute, uh, Results-Based Culture, and he's also the author of, of many, um, many books on leadership and management and so forth. But, but today, sort of the topic of the show is what, what Lou called the universal solvents to horrible work relationships. <laughs> and uh, so I re- that was a really, uh, really caught my eye when I read that. So the universal solvents to horrible work relationships. So what we really kind of get into is like, well, first of all, like, what is a horrible work relationship? Like, what does that look like? Um, and, and we really came at it from maybe a leadership perspective. So like, if you're in a bad work environment, what is that leader probably uh, acting like what, what's their behavior? What are their actions? And then we sort of flipped it around and then talked about some of the solvents or some of the things, some of the countermeasures, if you will, that we can do to sort of overcome those, those bad behaviors. And, um, boy, it was just a really interesting, it's one of those deals where I had some, some questions lined up and ready to go. And then just things would just kept popping up in my mind. And, and so we just we freestyled most of this conversation. So I, I think you're going to really, um, find some value in this one. So show notes can be found over at GembaPodcast.com. This is episode 486. Again, GembaPodcast.com. Look for episode 486. Also, go over to GembaEvents.com and check out some of the live instructor training events that we've got coming up down the road. So we're really excited. Yesterday, we did a uh, kind of a dating myself here because we were like a month or so ahead of the podcast right now. But uh, yesterday, we actually did a, a virtual caught it in a classroom workshop at like 80 some people show up and it was fantastic so we're having a lot of fun with these live instructor events so so go check that out over at gembaevents.com okay enough from me let's get to the show lou welcome to the show how are you hey thanks ron doing great today how are you doing i'm good man where are you calling in from calling in from palm beach gardens florida oh wow nice nice Yeah, right. How's the mosquitoes? Is that okay? It, it, hit me, hit me all right every day. But you have that that good stuff to keep them away from you. So no, listen, I know we talk about mosquitoes on a lean podcast, but I hope my wife doesn't listen to this. But she doesn't like me using these pesticides and all this stuff. But man, I found this. Uh, uh, this bifrin or whatever stuff and this other stuff. And I, I put it in it. I bought those little backpack sprayers because we've got a lot of mosquitoes here in Texas. And uh, man, I sprayed this stuff all around on my property. They're gone. <laughs> no. No, they're not. Yeah. Apparently, apparently you got to do it every three or four weeks, but Hey man, it's worth it. So yeah. the, the state has a, or the, the County has a, uh, an installation every season of a mosquito repellent. So it reduces the mosquito population. Yeah. And I, I, I put in an order to do the same with lizards. Mm. <laughs> we have oh, so man. many lizards. Yeah, you all got here. Just so much crazy, well, so it, much water, it, you know, and it's just, yeah. man. It's, it's, it's good. We're beginning this podcast with killing animals. Right. Yeah. Mosquitoes. I appreciate you coming on, man. This is going to be a fun uh, interview. So, um, as you know, Lou, we like to get things started out of the gate with our guests sharing a quote. So what do you have? Yeah, so I thought a little bit about this when, when you asked me uh, before. It was I was told this by, a, it was a CEO. She was a CEO, passed away. She was 106 years old by the way she passed away. It was incredible. Wow. Frances Hesselbein, good friend of mine, CEO of Girl Scouts of America formerly. And I was with her at the New York Stock Exchange, and she was uh, I was giving her an award there. And uh, to all these important people, and she uh, she heard me speaking, and for some reason she came over to me <laughs> after I spoke, and she came over my ear, and she actually knelt down. She's about ninety six then to my my ear. I was sitting down. She said, "Lou, be careful 
of your thoughts because they will become your words. Be careful of your words because they will become your actions. Be careful of your actions for they will become your destiny. Mm. And I, I thought about that and I thought, well, geez, what did I say wrong? Number one. <laughs> but number two, I thought, well, that's going to change really the way I think about life and the th- way I think about what real power I have with words mm. and how people really do look to me when I'm in front of these crowds. And, you know, I, didn't, I don't think much about, you know, you know, how important am I? I'm just another person, guy, you know, am I important? Well, I am when I'm up there. It's my responsibility. It's like when you, you, uh, you're you in a relationship, wife or, or, or whomever, I'm the only one. I'm it. Leaders yeah. have a responsibility at every moment to watch their words. Mm. They're very important. And when I heard that statement of sort of words matter, I thought to myself, well, what does that mean, words matter? Well, it means everything that you say can and will does have an impact on people. Yeah. So choose them wisely, be responsible in them, and do the right thing when you use them. Man, it's so interesting that you say that. It's freaky timing, actually. I was having a conversation this morning with a colleague, and I said, you know, we were just talking about some different stuff and different changes in the company and all that and nothing bad, but just some different stuff. And, and I I remember saying, I was sitting there talking and I was like, and, and then I was looking for the word and I'm like, I can't find the word and I know it matters and I'm worried about the next word I'm going to say, but, and I said it, you know, she goes, I get it. I get, I know what you mean, you know, and it wasn't again, but it was, you're right. You know, just, if you're just loose with your tongue and just sort of reckless, goodness gracious, you can leave a lot of damage behind you. Absolutely. That's right, Ron. And, and the way you described it just now in saying that you were looking for the, the right word, right? When I heard you say that, what's important is that you were looking. Mm. That's the yeah. most important thing. You were looking. Yeah. And the pause, there's so much power in a pause because typically when we pause, we give up control. Mm. And that's exactly what we need to do more of with people give up that control because we're so in control. We're in front of people in a crowd and we need to be listened to. But when we give up control for that pause, we're actually allowing others to talk Mm. and give them the opportunity to take, to take part in your speech, your discussion. So you're not dictating necessarily the discussion or being seen that way, at least perceived that way. Yeah. So the power of the pause, the power of finding the right words and thinking, well, what if I did take that pause at that moment? What if I did reflect on what I'm saying and does it have meaning to me in my own values? That's a powerful thing to do every day. Speaking of the pause, you know, Simon Sinek, you've probably seen Simon Sinek and read his books or whatever, but I remember he came to one of these big lean conferences a few years ago called AME. Um, and, uh, he, uh, he was the big keynote, you know, at the end and, and, uh, he came walking onto the stage. I was kind of excited. I read, you know, everybody's seen the why video and, you know, read his books and stuff. And, and, uh, he walks onto the stage. It's so powerful. It is. I remember it like it was yesterday and this was several years ago, walks onto the stage. Oh, it's Simon Sinek. Everybody's clapping, you know, and all of a sudden sort of, he gets to the center of the stage and the clapping starts to come down because, you know, he's going to start talking. And all of a sudden he just looks down at the ground and he takes his palms together and he starts rubbing his hands just slowly. And he's looking at the ground and I'm telling you, he paused for at least five seconds. It felt like 30 seconds. And I thought, oh my gosh, he, he forgot how to start or he's, he's frozen or or whatever. And all of a sudden I'm, I've never paid more attention to the person in my life than I did him at that moment. And then all of a sudden he looks up and he says, it was a dark day. I was like, oh my gosh, and he goes into this epic story, you know, whatever. And um, it was the most powerful opening to a keynote that I have ever seen, you know, and all he did was be quiet and just kind of look down and rub his hands together, you know. Like, What's interesting about that is at that very moment, he stood on that stage and he's rubbing his hands. He's summoning that dark day. Yeah. He's yeah. summoning it and he's he's becoming it. Yeah, because and it's it's like every time we go into a different environment, 
we have to pause and remember that we're about to take on a new role. Mm. And that role will change, transform every single individual as long as we're mindful of it and can become that role. So we're actors, really, mm. all of us mm. on the stage of management and leadership and results that we achieve, yeah. no matter what we're doing, we're, right. we're acting every day mm -hmm. and we're playing this role of uh, purveyor of excellence every day. And that's not easy. It takes a toll on us, yet we have to summon that darkness like Simon did yeah. <laughs> every day. Yeah. There's five seconds of truth yeah. for him and thinking through that context yeah. and just taking that moment because it's showtime, man. Yes, it's it. showtime. <laughs> and here showtime. I am, years later, talking about that opening, you know. I don't even know if, if he remembers it, but yeah, anyhow. Well, um, gosh, we've been talking for eight minutes now, and, and people don't even know who Lou is. So tell us about your background, Lou, and tell us about, you know, um, what you're up to these days and sort of work that you do and that sort of thing. So, so Simon can go up on stage, right? And everybody knows who he is. So who the heck is Lou Carter, right? <laughs> what is that all about? Isn't that funny though? In in all seriousness, Ron, like you know, we we assign roles, right? And we assign you know who you are. The truth is, you know, we're all back to anonymous, all of us. And I don't know if COVID did that, whatever that may be. I don't want to date the show. Mm -hmm. or what it may be, but we're, we are all back to anonymous. We all should be back to anonymous mm -hmm. uh, in some way. The key differentiator in talent is how well do you do in the moment? What are you doing? What role are you playing in the moment? Who are you playing that role for? And that's who you are at that moment, right? Mm -hmm. That's who you are in that moment. So, I can tell you, Lou, CEO, Best Practice Institute, creator of Most Love Workplace, published by Newsweek, the UK, Global, and the Glo and the America's Most Love Workplaces. Thank you, Lou. Writer of 12 books on leadership and management, including in great company. Developer of the Emotional Connectedness Research and the Love of Workplace Index. Okay, so what? Nah. I want to know who Lou is and what he's doing for me right now. Mm -hmm. Right now. That's so Lou right now is a guy on your show mm -hmm. who's going to talk to people who really love Six Sigma and do it every day and manage. And we're going to somehow have a discussion about how to create a better organization in career and day and life for them. So we're speaking to them. Yeah. So Lou's a guy speaking to your audience today, not just an author or a like guy who likes to boat or a guy who likes to, you know, I'm like you know, family and <laughs> take you know, care of mosquitoes. Takes care of mosquitoes in Florida and, and he uses <laughs> repellent. He doesn't like lizards. <laughs> I, mean, I don't mind him. It lose a guy's gonna talk to your audience today. And we're gonna talk about emotional connectedness. We're gonna talk about how to improve your your leadership, how to be how how to really get into this this focus that you have that's so hard. Every day you're being told to to improve your operations, to meet your deadlines, to be the best possible leader and manager you can be, right? And you're getting pushed down from your your VPs or your CEOs and being told what to do and you feel like you just have to do it or you'll be in trouble. Or here's the other one I hear all the time because I work with CEOs, I work with mid-sized companies and large companies, and I hear the same thing over and over again. It's their fault. Mm -hmm. Take that and rip it up and throw it in the garbage because it's never going to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see so many leaders say this to me, Ron, and it, it's happened to me all the time. They say This happens all the time. They say this to me. They say, I have to do that. It wasn't my choice, though. That's what the CEO told me to do. I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to be more lean. I'm supposed to put, implement this process. That's what I have to do. I don't believe in it, though. Mm-hmm. And when it goes wrong or they don't do it right, they say they told me to do it that way. Yeah. Who looks weak in that situation? The CEO who told them to do it or the manager and leader who said they had to do it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, m one might even say both. 
<laughs> right? I, I, I say the manager or leader. Yeah, because they're, <laughs> definitely they, them. Yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you why they they're weak because and they they definitely they're not weak. They look weak because mm. they're saying to people, "Someone told me to do something I didn't believe in, and I did it anyway." Mm. So I'm forced to do it. So you should be forced to do it too. Instead of saying, I've spoken with my CEO, my VP, I've talked to them at length. I debated the pros and cons of the different situ of the situation. We had a, a very healthy dialogue and came to the conclusion that together, this is the best possible thing for our company. Mm. Now, which one is going to win? Yeah. Yeah. The one who said I had to do it or the one that said I debated this at length and got to a conclusion and came to a conclusion. Yeah. This is best for all of us. Let's go in together and make it happen. Right. So which war is one better? The one where I'm told to do and go in and to fight or the one that I know I believe in because I've gone through an internal struggle or an internal understanding and with others and my bosses to fight that war. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. So it was interesting on the little intake form that we have for the for the podcast on the topic and the theme of of the episode. You had mentioned the universal solvents to horrible work relationships. I remember when I first saw that, I was like, "Whoa, that's pretty powerful little statement there." Universal solvents to horrible work relationships, building most loved workplaces. So, what makes a horrible work relationship, in your opinion? There's, there's a lot of factors for horrible re work relationships. The biggest one is blame. Blame is huge. Uh, it, it's one of the, the, the worst possible uh, behaviors you could, you could exhibit as a leader. Uh, blaming others for actions, blaming yourself, uh, blaming failure on others, it's, it, it's the worst. It, it's a terrible, it's, a, it, it's something that creates uh, huge consternation in, in companies. Uh, needing to be right all the time. Mm. I need to be right, be, to be correct. That's me. I said this. That's the only way. It's the only way that I, this is the, the way to do it. And it's hubristic, hubris leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, you believe you could do something no matter what and you just go through with it. You could, you, you win or you lose in that situation. Mm -hmm. All right. And, but if you co-create with people, that's the solvent. Mm -hmm. Co-create and what we had talked about before with, working with a leader rather than being told what to do and saying, oh, it's his or her fault, uh, then boom, right? It, it's blame. So the universal solvent to these things about need to be right, the need to blame, not take responsibility, not be a leader, is co-creating with people. Now, mm -hmm. George Bush Sr. always said the, the, the universal solvent to all conflict is humor. You know, even though he didn't have, he, he always said he could never deliver a punchline. Right. Mm. But he had others who were funny. Right. And he mm. laughed a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. And so as a leader, he also said he said to others who uh, he, he, he would always joke around with people who were not the president that he disagreed with. And he said, and I can name a couple of people who had a really low approval rating. He said he said to them, if you're so smart, why am I president? Mm. If you're so smart, why am I president? So mm. for me, what I think about is. Other leaders complain, other managers complain about their leaders, and they say that they're the smarter, have the smarter way. If they're so smart, why are they not the CEO? Mm. If they're so smart, why are they not the chair? Mm -hmm. So what, what, I, what I am proposing is a, is a fact of a respect for what is happening inside of an environment and understanding their, their perspectives and why they're doing what they're doing. Co-creation does that. Mm -hmm. A lot mm -hmm. gets in the way in that way, though. When they when there's people who have hubris, people who blame a lot, it's a lot harder to improve processes, a lot harder. So we have to come with a foundational solvent to mm -hmm. that, which is we believe we can, we will learn to create something together rather than have just our own and we'll go through whatever it takes to feel comfortable doing that. Even if I have to share my passion or uh, anger or frustration or, uh, or even my love for something, right? Yeah. Um, we accept our feelings for what they are at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, something you mentioned just um, a minute ago, you said something to, something to the effect of blame about blame and how, how bad leaders will blame others. And, but then you even mentioned, they blame themselves. 
And I thought, boy, isn't that interesting that you blame yourself? So I wondered to maybe just explore that a little bit, thinking about blaming yourself. Like, I felt like I might be guilty of that myself for me. If I blame myself for, if one of my teenage kids goes awry, I, I feel like this shame, like, what did I do wrong? How I failed them as a father, you know, um, or, or perhaps there's even this thing of like trying to take personal accountability for my actions. So maybe there's this, I don't know, this connection between sort of accountability and blame. What does that, what do, what do you think about that as mm -hmm. it relates to yourself? It's a lot of unpacking, a lot of unpacking. What I, what I, what I've always noticed is that we blame ourselves first. I, when we have something that goes wrong, that's mm -hmm. the first blame that occurs. It, 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 the outward appearance is easier to blame others after that. Mm -hmm. It's harder to say to yourself, I did it right. Mm -hmm. I did it. So let's look at the situation of employees doing something wrong. It's my fault. They did something wrong. I know there's kids at play here. So it's a wholly, totally different emotional yeah, yeah, situation. Yeah. <laughs> but, so I, I moved away from it just to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, yeah. <laughs> just because it's highly emotional. Maybe it is the same though. So let, let's look at it for a second. You have to ask yourself, number one, is it true? So somebody who blames themselves a lot, sounds like you have, which is fine. It's normal. It's human. I've done the same. So I go to my, I say to myself, is it true? Is it really true? Did I cause my child to do X, Y, Z? Did I cause them to? Did I show them too much of my own behaviors and what I do, thus they're doing these behaviors as a result. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of, you can't control a lot after that. It's already done. The damage mm -hmm. is done. You think it's done. So the solvent to that is to ask everyone you're around to be better than you. Your job is to be better than me. Mm. Don't be who I am. Now you've heard other things or people say, do, do, do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Not too different than that really. Other yeah. than saying what I tell you to, to do here is be better than I am. You are a better version. I want you to be a better version of me and I'm going to give you the tools, resources, vision, yeah, values to do that. Yeah. Don't expect me to be that person because I have faults just like everybody else. And yep. don't just look to me as your role model or mentor. Like I'll do my level best to be there, but I'm human and I'm human, not, but yeah. I will do my best and I'm human. Maybe yeah. So, yeah. and we'll be careful of our words because words are just flying now. Right. Mm. So I'm going to be careful of my words and I will be my level be at my level best. And I'm going to fall. I'm going to slip. Don't use my words all the time because they're not the best. Mm. Use your own, be at your best, develop yourself. At the end of the day, everybody's responsible for their own actions and decisions. Yeah. We, we are not responsible for other people's actions and decisions. And we have to remember that is that in this, as just as much as we're not responsible for the way we feel after their actions and decisions. Now mm. responsibility comes into play when we say we're not responsible for the actions and decisions. That's in, Interesting because we actually are inside of an organization system seen to be responsible for their actions and decisions. Yeah. So this is a, this is a, this is a polarity. We yeah. are responsible for actions and decisions by mm -hmm. virtue of our hierarchy. So yes. what do you do in situations like that? Well, yeah. yeah. In fact, <laughs> had a very similar conversation um, recently I had, had been asking some team members to, you know, try these, some new things, some new activities that they weren't normally doing as part of their job description. And it was really fragmenting them and making it difficult for them to do their, their core job, you know, like their main job, if you will. And so I, what I realized was they weren't doing especially great on these tangential things that I was asking them to do. And vice versa, it was starting to impact their, their main job. And so I realized that was my fault. You know, I had to take ownership of that. So I apologized to them. We hired a new person who took over the new tangential type activities so they could focus on that. And then the core team member could do it. So, but yeah, it was a hundred percent my, whatever, uh, I don't want to say fault or whatever. I mean, I didn't do it maliciously. I wasn't trying to hurt 
the company or hurt that person. But, you know, it was a strategic decision that I made. And after reflection on it, I realized that, gosh, it's not the best. And so we adjusted, right? And now things are great. Everybody's happy and we're doing doing great. But it, it took me, you know, some some humility <laughs> to go to those folks and say, hey, I, I literally said, sorry, you know, I shouldn't have done that. And that was a mistake. And, and uh, but here, here's how we're going to fix it. And, you know, everybody was super appreciative of it. And um, yeah. So, I mean, you're right. I mean, as a leader of a company, you got to take, I mean, I remember Mr. Toyota um, from the Toyota family who, 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 who stood up. I remember after Toyota had all their quality issues, you know, a year or so ago or a few years ago, they don't have very many quality issues, but they had one and he stood up and I'll never forget. He just said, I'm sorry. Those were the first words that he said, I'm sorry. And then he paused and then he went on about how this was never going to happen again. And, you know, it's true. It's never going to happen again. I'm very confident in that. Um, But, you know, taking, having that, uh, taking that accountability and that ownership, to me, that's authentic leadership. And the I'm sorry must live on its own. Mm. I'm sorry. And the accountability part that you're describing, how it will be better in the future is self-coaching. Hmm. So you're, what, what's happening at the moment as, as a leader is you're recognizing the failure, which is a leadership behavior. And then the second is you're giving yourself feed forward that others, meaning they're giving advice that others would have given you already. And you're superseding that process. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. You, you had mentioned earlier, I wanted to come back to this um, in your sort of in your intro talked about these, the top most love workplaces. So I'm wondering if we could, you, you sort of talked a little bit about what you shouldn't do. To, if you want to have a horrible workplace, you should blame, you should, you know, that. But if you want to have a, an incredible loved workplace, what are, is it just simply the opposite? You don't blame or is it more to it? There are specific things you do need to do. Okay. Uh, now, what, what I want to say is, number one, there there are universal solvents. It requires you bring them together, though, uh, as uh, it's an alchemy of sorts. Um, the, the, there's five different areas. The first is throughout the company having systemic collaboration. That means you create together and you do have processes in place that enable you to go out and create with your constituents. So you can be like Mr. Toyota and one day say sorry and know what to say that to how you can fix it. You can only do that through collaboration and collecting understanding of your environment and actually giving them an ability to collaborate together. Now, Mr. Toyota also has a big vision, right? That's his positive vision of his future. What he knows needs to happen so that everybody in the enterprise, every single employee knows that when they come into work in the morning, they're taking part in that vision. That's number two. Number three is that my values as an individual aligns with the stated and espoused values of the company. If you spout continuous improvement, you also want to continually improve and get better over time. I'm sorry, and I'll do this better later. Mm. The alignment of values. Respect is when you, sh- you show and you get back respect as a currency. Now, what does that mean? Respect is a lot of different things, a lot of different people. When it is a cultural norm, it's far easier to know if you're getting it or giving it. Mm. So respect equals trust. Trust equals respect. You do what you say you're going to do is part of respect and part of trust. You have to you have to build up that currency. People value respect even more than monetary currency. We showed it in our research. People ask if they would prefer salary over respect when it comes to providing more voluntary discretionary effort. They chose respect, believe it or not. Jackie Robinson said, uh, you don't have to respect me or you don't don't have to be my friend. You do need to respect me, though. Arguably one of the best baseball players of all time and was disrespected, throwing tomatoes at him. No one cared about him. But and and Jackie said. I don't want to be your friend. Just respect me. Give me respect for my talent. Give me mm-hmm. respect. Different people define different ways. Some put comp and Ben salary in front of that and say, that's why you're not respecting me. Well, that's not true. Comes out to be other things. You didn't talk to me about it. Talk mm-hmm. to me about it. Collaborate with me. Understand me. Respect my talent. Last, achievement. 
last is achievement, giving people the resources and development they need to be successful. You can give people a task, but if they know the development or know the process or what to do and how to do it to develop and grow, well, it's harder to achieve it. So those are the five things, systemic collaboration, positive vision of the future, aligning values, respect, and then what we call knock it out or killer outcomes or achievement. You need all five of those. They're the they're 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 the solvents, if you will, or the amalgam of metals that create this greater, uh, stronger metal and 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 Toyota car uh, mm. than, than, that that form emotional connectedness. Those are really it, and that Got forms it. love. It forms love. The experiment I did uh, with uh, with people, I, I I put them in a room, and I and I had twelve people. I split them up into two groups of six, and my goal was to see who would who would help each other more. And so my goal is I want to find out what causes people to feel emotionally connected to each other so much so that they will help them out in their careers. That was my number one goal. So I, I put one group in a, in a room and said, find out a way that you should endorse each other on LinkedIn and help each other out with your careers. Just one group in another one room. And I put another group in another room and I said, okay, Let's talk about what it will take for you to develop each other's careers and endorse each other on LinkedIn. And it turned out I, those five areas came out of it. And the group that I didn't have any treatment for got angry. They were upset that they were being taped. They thought the light in the room was too hot. They told us to reduce the uh, air conditioning. They freaked out and they left. The other group all endorsed each other on LinkedIn because they, they all got together for beers after and they all stay in contact to this day. Why? They worked it out. Why? They collaborated. They looked at their, they looked at their values. They discussed what respect was. They saw what they were going to do as a result of helping each other. It was clear. The other group didn't know what to do. When left alone, people will do absolutely nothing. Given a context, and given a structure and process, they will help each other. So I, I am in the face of what people normally say, which is believe in human nature. Uh, uh, create human nature, Mm. (laughs) give processes for human nature and human nature will thus unearth into something greater than what it was before. Hmm. Wow. That's pretty powerful. Like I, 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 when I saw that, when I was kind of reading a little bit about you, you that about this experiment and the power of love. And I, I was super interested to explore that with you because like, I, I'm, I'm, I love looking at words like love. Um, you know, like even in like in the Bible, there's different types of, they'll use the word like eros is for like, you know, like romantic love and then filio, which is, you know, fraternal or like brotherly love, right? Philadelphia, right? And then agape is this self-sacrificial love. So it's like what, what God would show for you, like is agape, right? So I'm curious, like, like maybe is it more like sort of like filio and agape mixed together? Obviously it's not eros, hopefully, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, you, w- what do you think about that? Is it sort of like this brotherly love, you know, that we're seeking or is it self-sacrificial love or w- what do you think for, in a workplace? So our beginnings, the beginning of our research looked at companion love and then looked at effective commitment. So we, we took two organizational learning philosophies and uh, figured out, well, which of it is going to connect into giving voluntary, more, vo- more voluntary discretion effort, meaning perform more, stay longer. Those are our two things. We wanted to measure perform more for the company and stay longer. Those are those are the two things we majorly wanted to know. There's other organizational outcomes we wanted too, but those are the two we were mainly concerned with. So um, definitely Eros was off out the window <laughs> immediately. Uh, so we didn't look at, that's called, uh, there's that companion is friendship love. The other one is com- commensurate love. It's, it's, it's the Eros. It's the, it's the uh, uh, sexual or uh, mm-hmm. yeah. the, the yeah. relationship driven love. It wasn't, we, we knocked that that's out the window. Yeah. Uh, so especially when it comes to the workplace, yeah. um, a totally different um, meaning. So uh, there was an experiment by Arthur Ahrens that I examined at the time about Eros love that I used to form this experiment for 
relate for work relationship love. And his was to ask a series of questions for each other. So he brought people in a room and, and, they, and they went in twos and he had them answer a series of about 52, 61 questions for each other and look each other in your eyes very for, for a long while. And then, now I did it so that it doesn't become creepy, but this is to, get, to mm-hmm. look each other in your eyes and answer these questions and just stare there and be with each other. That experiment showed that you do have more eros love. You develop, your, the, as you said, eros love and fraternal love than if you did not have that experiment. So I said, well, what's it going to take in the workplace? Because it's different. It's very different. So in the workplace, we, we found out that they are leadership behaviors and competencies more so than it was just this, uh, just a friendship. Friendship was not part of it. So f- seeing these behaviors of being more collaborative being more respectful, aligning with the values of the company and my my values, knowing that I have a part in what I'm doing and being given the tools and resources necessary to achieve what I set out to achieve, that's the emotional connectedness. Mm. So that's when you perform activities like that, one-on-one and in threes, same way Arthur Aarons did it, same way. So it just with different questions, different statements, you will create and achieve emotional connectedness. You, you just can't do the the Euro stuff because that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. get you into trouble. Yeah. Right, right, wow. right, right. Wow, super interesting. Yeah, it's um yeah, it's it's really fun having you on because obviously it's a slightly different take than our our normal sort of lean sort of podcast that I have. But I think all the things that you're saying are so complementary to what we're really trying to do as we're invoking change, trying to change the world to make it a better place and change our workplaces and and so forth. But in the end, what we are doing as lean thinkers is it's a human based system, you know, people. It's a people based system. <laughs> people are cooperating with one another and uh, trying to get things done. And, and in the end, we do need to connect on, uh, you know, and in, in, in sometimes pretty deep, you know, v- many times vulnerable, you know, environments where to say, I don't know, or I need help. You know, it's very vulnerable to do that. And it's not easy sometimes. But uh, I think it's 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 critical to to be able to practice that and 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 do that from time to time. Absolutely. You have to. Being vulnerable and being authentic is is a necessity for leadership and following through is yeah. essential too. Trusting. They all are. The five the five areas you, you you have to you have to practice them every day and realize the the your worth. Yeah. Nice. Lou, if people want to connect with you, um um I know you've you've written some books and you've got a pretty awesome website that I was scouring earlier today. What's the best way for folks to, to, to reach out with you? You go to Simon <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the K E K. Right, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Everyone needs to know how to get in touch with me. Yeah. Lewis Carter.com. Most love workplace.com uh, is, is really where you go is most love workplace.com. You look at me at, at best practice Institute too, but Lewis Carter and most love workplace will, will get you there right away. Okay. Yeah. And we'll link everything up here on the show notes. So all you got to do, folks, is just kind of scroll down on your app there and we'll have all the, all the links there to uh, to connect with Lou. Are you on LinkedIn as well? I, I assume. Yeah, I am on LinkedIn. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. You can, yeah. yeah. I'm one of the, the, the sea of people who are swimming yeah. on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. All right. Well, hey, I really appreciate you coming on. This was a lot of fun, Lou. Um, keep up the great work and maybe we'll have we'll have you on again down the road and we'll keep talking. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Ron. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. Thanks for listening. Whether you've been on the continuous improvement journey for many years or perhaps you're just getting started, Gemba Academy is here to support you. And while we're best known for our more than 1,500 Lean and Six Sigma teaching and virtual tour videos, we also have a team of experienced Lean and Six Sigma practitioners available for one-on-one coaching, as well as a variety of Lean and Six Sigma certification options. To learn more and to schedule a demo, head on over to GembaAcademy.com.